Hello, welcome to my talk. It's called Managing Luck, High Reliability Practices to Improve Your FRC Odds. Thank you to teams 4400, 1868, 1156, and 503 for setting up uh, FRC warm-up and inviting me. Um, I apologize in advance to your job uh, trying to translate this as I have to speak about twice as fast as I normally do to fit this talk within 40 minutes. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. Who am I? I'm Brendan Simons. I'm a professional engineer and manager at a company called Stern Laboratories. Uh, we do services for the nuclear industry. Um, I am also one of the lead mentors for Celtex, Team 5406, and I helped found that team in 2015. Uh, we're out of Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Uh, we uh, maintain a facility called the Robodrome, where uh, other teams can use our practice field and our shop. Um, and uh, we've tried to learn lots and lots of lessons uh, since 2015 and get better and, and try and share those with other teams. So that's what I'm going to do today. Um, what are high reliability practices? These are ways to make sure your robot does the thing it's intended to do. Okay, They're based on techniques from so-called high reliability industries. These are things like my industry, the nuclear industry the aerospace industry, uh, the medical industry, places where safety and dependability are mandatory. They're way more important than extreme performance, right? It's more important that your airplane makes it from point A to point B uh, without any uh, damage, without any flaws, um, than it is to take five, uh, to save five minutes and not do a pre-flight checklist, right? Um, so all of these lessons are usually pretty hard one. They usually, every lesson has usually come out of a, uh, an accident um, because uh, these industries need to get down to 100% reliability. Um, to do that, they usually have three things. They usually have an understanding of risk theory. We're going to spend a bit of time on that. This is kind of the mathematics of risk. Um, unfortunately, it's too big a topic to talk too much about uh, in the time I've got. Uh, it's also a commitment to culture. What does it mean by culture? I mean, everybody on the team has to believe in this. They have to think about um, focusing on caution, on preparedness and continuous improvement. Um, and they think about that more than they do about sort of extreme performance. Um, and it means putting all those into practice. So policies and procedures to maximize reliability based on your lessons learned. Um, I'm not an expert, our team isn't perfect at this, so, so don't think that I'm sitting here um, from a pedestal telling you exactly how you can build perfect robots. Um, but uh, we are trying to get better every year. Our goal is no on-field breakdowns. We're not there yet in 2023. We had some on-field breakdowns, but um, we're doing a lot better than we did in 2015 and 2016. Um, and I'm gonna give you examples of some of the things that did go wrong uh, so that uh, you know that we're we're working hard to getting better and, and maybe they can help you in your quest to get better. Why does FRC need HRPs? Um, here's the thing. Each event gives us nine or 10 qualification matches. Uh, so at a couple events, you maybe have maybe have half an hour uh, of on-field time to test two or three months of work, 100, 150 hours uh, of, of time building your robot, all done in 30 minutes. That's pretty unforgiving. Um, and then if your robot doesn't do that, uh, doesn't do the thing it's designed to do during a match, that's a feel bad moment. A lot of teams uh, and a lot of students are gonna be demotivated seeing their robot fail on the field more than they were motivated uh, in the three months of preparation for that, right? Um, they wanna see the robot do the thing it's designed to do. Um, and they can learn from failure, sure, but um, they can also learn from successes, right? Um, the competition is getting stronger in FRC. Um, you know, without the bag day, robots are getting better. The 2023 robots are doing far more cycles than even the 2019 or 2018 robots did. Um, and last year we switched to double elimination playoffs. So every playoff match, uh, you get one shot to, to fight each round, each, each um, opponent. And if you lose that match, you drop down to a lower bracket. And if you lose that match again, you're out. So really you don't get a redo like you used to do in the single elimination best of three matches. So you really have to have your robots perform reliably in order to make it through the new playoffs uh, schedule. Um, and then error precursors, you know, we, we start uh, each uh, year with uh, almost a, at least a 50% new crew on my team. Um, so lots of uh, unfamiliarity, lots of students who, who haven't been um, exposed to robotics, I've never some of whom have never picked up a tool before. Um, they are rushed. They face a lot of stress. 
Uh, they're going to be fatigued, especially as we get to the, towards the end of build season and, and competition season. Um, they're uh, facing a lot of janky equipment, right? The robots that are built by students um, are not going to be up to industry standards. And these are all uh, reasons why errors are going to be more likely. We have to work harder to prevent them, um, which gives Murphy's Law uh, plenty of opportunity. Um, Murphy's Law, if you don't know, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So if we want to prevent things from going wrong, we have to identify all the things that can go wrong and do something about them. So this is where HRPs come into. We have on Celtex a kind of a four part plan for doing that. Um, one is preparation. So making sure before the event that we have um, trained and, and managed our uh, trained people and managed our risk to avoid incidents. Two is robot design. I'm gonna spend too much time on that. Um, there's lots to learn about that and lots that we can do better in order to make our robot more reliable in the design stage. Uh, three is reliability focused maintenance, catching any, any failures that might get through the design and making sure they don't impact your performance. And then four, just making sure we learn our lessons and always doing better, continuous improvement. Um, in my industry, we use this thing called OPEX, which is operational experience. We wanna look at all of the experiences we have and share them with our team, with other teams and, and make plans to, to learn from them and get better. So understanding risk theory going to spend a very little bit of time on this. Let's start with the Swiss cheese model of accidents. Um, this is coined by James Reason in 1990. And it's strange to me that it's 1990, right? It seems pretty late considering that, you know, um, machines were being first built in, uh, in the 1700s, 1800s. Um, and then, you know, the nuclear industry, for instance, started in the 1940s, 1950s. It took 50 years to sort of change the way we thought about accidents before then. Um, the goal to make the perfect machine was that you would buy the perfect material, you would have the perfect design, the smartest designers, and then you would assign the best um, operators who are you know, the most carefully trained and would follow their uh, instructions to the letter. And if that was done, no problem would happen. And of course, problems happened, right? Because you can't build the perfect machine. You can't find material that is infallible. You can't even understand all the problems that are going to happen, right? There's a limitation to our understanding of the universe. So what can you do? If you assume that events or errors uh, are going to happen anyway, it's just human nature, they're statistically unavoidable, they're going to get through, they're going to occur, you need to stop them knowing that they happen from becoming an accident or a failure. And to do that, you put these things called barriers. And we call them Swiss cheese because each barrier we know is gonna have a hole in it or two holes or three holes. Like some things are gonna stop. You're not gonna be able to have a perfect barrier that stops every event. Um, so you put lots of barriers and hopefully the holes kind of block each other and you have enough barriers, you call it defense in depth. You can stop all of the events from becoming an accident um, if you have enough of them and they're uh, effective. Um, so that's a continuous process um, because you won't understand uh, exactly what it takes. You'll have to learn as you go. There is a hierarchy of barriers, right? Um, the most effective ones uh, are ones that we can say uh, are elimination. Um, this is often used in, in safety analysis. So you have a risk, say you have a pneumatic system. The easiest way to get rid of that risk is to just lift the system out. If you can design around it, if you don't need it, get rid of it, right? Those barns aren't there, they're not gonna fail. Sometimes you can't though, right? Um, our climbing system in 2019, in 2022, I apologize, um, needed a pneumatic system in order to open up claws. So um, in this case, you wanna substitute the risky parts of that system with more reliable parts. So you start thinking about COTS components that are um, trusted. Uh, you start thinking about um, tubing that you know is really, uh, maybe oversized, maybe carefully, uh, you know, extra thickness walls, um, fittings that are, are really you know, beefy and tough, even if that costs more, um, and then tying everything down securely. Um, so if you can't eliminate a problem, substitute the parts of that problem with something a little bit more reliable that does the same job. Uh, engineering controls, okay, now we're getting smaller, right? Um, we're getting smaller because uh, we're gonna trap fewer faults with this barrier, it has less effectiveness. Um, engineering controls are things that uh, are designed uh, on the robot, um, on the machine to stop 
problems. So they don't involve any humans involved uh, to, to operate them. So things like guards, right? You might have a Lexan guard around the bottom of your robot um, to prevent another robot from coming inside your frame perimeter and damaging things. Um, that uh, is an engineering control. Another thing might be a automatic sensor or a monitoring of a current that can change the way the robot drives if it knows uh, that a motor is about to fail or, or you're low on battery voltage or something like that. Don't require operator interface, but you already have kind of a, a failure happening um, in this case. You haven't eliminated the, the risk. Um, for instance, the barrier, uh, the guard, you know, you already are expecting a robot to jump into your, your frame perimeter and that guard might fail itself. Um, so hopefully you can design that uh, to be as good as possible as well as designing um, to eliminate the risk that, that nothing behind that guard um, is super, super risky or super, super um, dangerous for your, for your robot. Okay, once we get out of engineering controls, we have administrative controls. These are things that require a human interface. So in 2017, our robot used to smash its intake all the time uh, on the um, barrier between the uh, uh, airship uh, sections. And we would tell our driver, just don't drive there. Well, of course, you have a teenager driving. It's a big, fast robot. Your vision is blocked. You're being um, pushed by other robots. You can't always prevent it. So that's why administrative controls like um, you know, telling the driver not to do that is less effective. It's still needed, but um, it'd be better if you could design, a, you know, if you do some substitution, if you could design a stronger intake that could take that impact. Lastly is mitigation. So that means um, assuming the failure is going to happen, your intake is going to break, your um, you know, your whatever component of your robot is going to fail, your pneumatic system is going to leak, what do you do in that case? Do you already know, is it a surprise? Or do you already know, when my intake dies, I'm going to go climb. When my pneumatic system dies, I can still um, do, I can still shoot for the mid goal and I won't be able to climb so I can maybe spend some more time out doing that. I don't have to make decisions. Um, so training for the consequences of a failure. So, um, in this plan, we want to do uh, preparation. Uh, and we talk about doing preparation in the off season. Um, if you're wasting time during build season, trying to learn new techniques, um, securing funding materials, training students, then that's all time that you could be building your robot and, and perfecting the design and iterating that design. So do all that in the off season. That was a hard lesson for me. I never wanted to, to, uh, to work in the summer. and We didn't for 2015 and 2016, but my students convinced me. We actually built this sort of t-shirt cannon and I'm glad they did because it was super fun. Um, the cool thing is it doesn't matter if you, if you don't finish, um, you know, then there's no consequence to it, but uh, you can take more risks. Uh, you can let students try new things. Uh, and then occasionally you can build a fun little toy to bring up to football um, tournaments. Um, so having fun is important too. And the, the uh, off season is a good chance to do that. Really important, manage your schedule risk. Um, you need, you know, time is the most important resource in FRC. So I recommend building this um, chart called a Gantt chart where every task gets its own bar and every bar is the length of time it will take. So there's a kind of a calendar on the X axis here. And these bars are connected so that if this task, you know, this task here requires that both this task and this task be done. So even though this task is done early, this task cannot start until this first one finishes. Um, the important part with there is you can monitor it as you go. You can say, ah, this task is taking me two more days and shift it out. And that will move all of these by the relationships so that you can see where the endpoint's going to be. So why do you do that? Well, because if your endpoint that's projected is going to be the day after competition, that's no good to you, right? And too often teams will make these estimates and then they'll say, ah, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. We'll be fine. We're, yes, we're two days behind schedule, but we'll make that up. We don't have to change anything. We just have to work harder. And I really want to push against that because, you know, um, you can't invent time. What you can do is plan for buffer. So plan to be done early. And if your plan doesn't make that happen, then you need to cut parts out of your plan. You need to cut scope. That can be hard to do when some student has been working for a week on some you know, crazy awesome um, software feature or uh, climbing mechanism. Uh, y you have to be, as a project manager, you kind of have to be the bad guy sometimes and say, no, that needs to come off. Um, and 
we will come back to it later. We will come back to that project um, if we finish the other ones on time. But if we don't cut that scope, we're not going to be finished on time. And there's nothing worse than the whole robot um, not being able to make it to competition because everything was waiting, for instance, on your climber to be finished. And, and that didn't get done, so nothing got done. Um, so planning for off-ramps too, making sure your schedule uh, can work even if you cut scope, right? Have a, have a um, backup plan and a backup backup plan. You know, if you know something's going to be risky, you know this climber's not going to work. So for instance, in 2018, we had a buddy climb system. We didn't finish that until uh, maybe the weekend before competition uh, because it was going to be hard. So we left space on the robot where it was going to be and we designed everything else out and we were fortunate to finish in time to come back to it and put it on. Uh, but if we had designed, spent a bunch of time designing that ahead of time, none of the other robot might have gotten finished. Um, but you have to be ruthless. You have to um, make sure the schedule is adhered to. Um, otherwise, uh, bad things happen. And then uh, train for failure. So make sure you're at, in that schedule is some time on the field. You have to make sure that the robot uh, gets out to the field as early as possible, week four maybe of uh, since competition, to, to find those teething issues. So an example, in 2022, our first intake, we went out um, in week four, we had our driver tryouts, and the, and the uh, tryout drivers just smashed that thing to bits. They, just, they drove it against the wall a couple times and just broke apart, so we had to redo that intake completely. And it's very, I'm very glad that we learned that lesson in week four and not at our first competition. Um, when the robot does break in training, though, you have to practice um, decision points. You have to um, practice uh, knowing what to do when the robot breaks. Uh, so for instance, in 2022, we had a vision controlled uh, turret that would find the goal and shoot in it. Uh, if that camera broke down the ins uh, or, you know, or the actuator broke down, the instinct was, I'll oh, stop the practice. That doesn't count. You know, I'm, I'm counting my cycles here and I, my ego is hurt. I, I really want a working robot for me to show off my best. And we had to fight against that and say, no, look, this could happen in a real match. So um, what do you do? If the, if the turret won't spin, how can you get the robot over to the low goal maybe and turn the whole robot so that you can still score into the low goal and make some points? Or maybe it's broken so badly you're not going to be able to score, so now you know you're going to take the extra time to go climb um, and you're not going to spend any time uh, on field making decisions. Um, that's the same goes for pit team, right? That they once they see those failures, practice repairing those things as quickly as possible because it could happen. And then train backups. Um, we had uh, some students get sick with COVID over the last couple of years. And, you know, that's going to happen if you rely on one person uh, to be healthy. Um, you're, again, not preparing for failure. So um, have some backup drivers and backup pit leads uh, and backup awards presenters and all those things ready to go. So that leads us to section two, risk-informed robot design. Um, there are lots of ways to design your robot to be uh, less at risk of failure. Um, but one of the things that everyone talks about is minimizing complexity. So making your robot have fewer degrees of freedom, fewer motors, you know, electing to go with a two-stage elevator instead of a three-stage elevator, or um, a, you know, a, a single degree of freedom arm instead of a two degree of freedom arm, those kind of things, if you can accomplish it, there will be less components to break. Something that's less um, obvious is, is these things called uh, error likely designs okay so designs that if you give it two seconds thought are probably going to fail on you and um, if they fail will have sort of a disastrous consequence for your performance a good example in 2017 this is our gear intake which picked up off the floor it had a little sensor uh, to see if the the claw here had picked up a gear and then automatically grab that gear and flip it up so it'd be as quickly as possible um, the problem is that our, the way we had this programmed is uh, if that, in, that sensor broke, which it obviously did at some point, um, the intake wouldn't work at all. It wouldn't close the jaws. There was nothing the drivers could do to pick up a gear, and basically you've lost the match at that point. Uh, it would have been better to design that sensor just to put up a light or rumble the joystick pad or, or something, uh, the controller, um, just something to tell the operator that they've got a gear rather than sort of make that sensor a mandatory part of the component um, or have a backup manual mode that you can still work even if your sensor dies. And the same thing goes for limit switches. I, I don't think limit switches are needed. You can drive a mechanism against a hard stop if you design it properly and then that gets rid of a whole other sensor that could go wrong. 
Um, precise starting configurations is another example of an error likely design. Um, better to have something that is more capable of, of different orientations or can tell its way around the field with its sensors. Um, one shot at this design. So in 2016, a robot had to pass underneath a very low bar and then reach up super high, um, maybe eight feet um, after a one foot tall uh, low bar in order to be able to climb. And to solve that hard problem of stretching up that far, uh, some teams designed these sort of like Batman style grappling hooks that shot out with a spring loaded um, catapult that launched a hook on a rope and would catch that uh, bar and then lift yourselves up. And that's really cool, like really awesome design. But the problem is, even if you design that perfectly, even if it you know repeatedly goes to the same place every single time, you might get you know, a driver that presses the button early. You might get bumped by a you know by your partner robots and uh, miss that that hook latching right. Uh, and then once it's shot off, that's it. You're done. You can't reset the the hook and shoot it again. So it's much more reliable to build a hook that kind of extends on a telescope, and then the drivers can spend some time positioning the hook and, and, and lifting themselves up. And if they miss repositioning and, and lifting themselves up. Um, and that, that happens more often than you'd think. So thinking about those design uh, impacts is important. Um, here's where I differ a lot from a lot of uh, FRC designers um, impact. I think that we need to design um, really conservatively. I think uh, it's more important, especially in these days where we have more options for commercial off the shelf parts, uh, COTS parts and um, tubing and things that you design things that are sort of overbuilt. Um, it, the prevailing wisdom is to make things as light and fancy as possible, you know, carbon fiber rods and, and super light tubing. And, um, and I would say, look, the best way you can, you can build a robot, you know, there's only so many things to think about and, and we don't all have finite element analysis simulation softwares to, to uh, like, F, like F1 ro um, racing car design teams do to, to get every ounce of the robot. You know, use the time you have to make the decisions um, that are hard, how to pick up a game piece. And the, those decisions about um, whether or not your elevator is strong enough uh, should be something you, you don't spend any time on. You should just get the heaviest wall tube that you think you can fit um, without making the robot too heavy or too top heavy. Um, similar with steel gears, um, similarly with you know putting lightning holes in metal and plastic, like get rid of all that. Just just build something strong, and then you don't have to think about it, and you can trust it. Um, if you're going to use COTS parts, I highly recommend it. You know, Swerve Dive Specialties SDS have a Swerve module now that's up to Mark IV. If you make one of your own, it might be cheaper in the first part, but you're only at Mark I, so you're going to make the same mistakes that Patrick did in Mark I and Mark II and Mark III. Why not buy that OPEX from him? Why not um, get the, the proven um, uh, product? And for that reason, don't buy a product that is first on the market uh, because you know there's, that's a Mark I design. It might have problems. Why not wait for the next year um, so that they can come up with Mark II or they can at least identify the problems. Um, for yourself, stick with problems that are already solved and, and spend the off-season doing those solutions. Um, and uh, lastly, I would say design your robots for impact in the frame perimeter. Here's a very good example. Um, our 2022 robot had air cylinders for the climbing hooks. They were back, stored back here at the back of the robot. Um, perfectly within our frame perimeter, we would have got a foul for, you know, theoretically for any robot that damaged them. Uh, but of course, a foul doesn't mean anything uh, if you still lose the match because you can't climb. And we had to replace these cylinders like, I don't know, 30 times over the course of uh, the competition season got very, very expensive just because we didn't really think uh, about where these were in relation to the bumper and other robots kind of colliding with us. Um, add redundancy. Uh, so this is hard to do, um, but you can do things like add a second motor to your intake. Intakes are usually pretty low reduction. They're usually pretty symmetric. So you can usually add a motor to either side. Um, and as long as those motors can back drive each other and can work with only one motor, um, then you can deal with a failure of any one motor on one gearbox and still intake. And you know, that can be important on, on something like an intake that goes out of frame perimeter and goes into harm's way. Um, but they, you have to be careful because if those motors can't back drive each other, you've actually made the whole thing more risky um, because 
either motor could fail and the whole machine wouldn't work. So redundancy is kind of hard to think about, um, but if you can add more um, parallel mechanisms that can work independently, then, then that can really help. Uh, think about single points of failure. So the CAN bus is a good one. Unfortunately, you can't eliminate it. Um, it's pretty much needed for modern programming. Um, so then you start thinking about substitution. What are the connectors that are the most reliable? What are the, the topologies? What is the, the wiring practice that makes things um, the, the less likely, the least likely to fail? Um, so um, pneumatics is another good one, right? If you can eliminate it, that's great. If not, substitute it with the best practices. Um, and then if you can't have reliability, have resilience. You know, think about what happens if you do have uh, a flaw. Um, I call this emergency routes to scoring. So in 2022, for instance, um, this is our robot that climbed up with this uh, windmill climb and had claws that were pneumatically released. Um, and it could do so in seven seconds. Um, but if the pneumatic system died, we thought about how can we get up to at least level one or level two without releasing those hooks. So we had uh, kind of a, a motorized release mechanism that could get us at least to that first part. We thought about what are the consequences of climbing without. Similarly, we also thought about if our automated climb system broke down, do we have a manual way of doing that? We trained our operator to be able to climb, not in seven seconds, but in 10 seconds manually. And that actually happened during an event. Um, you can also uh, start looking at the consequences of failure. So uh, this is our 2017 robot again, and you might not see, there's a little sign here that says no gears, no, uh, because we had uh, human players accidentally throw gears into our, our fuel hopper here, and that would end the match for us because you're only allowed to carry one gear, and this hopper was not meant to carry gears. So we put a little sign, an administrative barrier that said don't put gears here, and uh, that was helpful. Um, also designed for maintenance, right? So uh, think about how you can get your wheels off. That's one of the reasons we switched pretty early on to this West Coast Drive design. Um, but also think about um, how you can get to uh, the electrical components you need to see, right? All, all of these Spark Maxes and all the new motors have lights on them that tell you things. So you need to be able to see those lights. That's why we like putting all of our electronics under the belly pan. Um, we usually put a, a like Zen guard over top of this as well, just to keep um, field debris out. Um, but that means we can turn the robot over very quickly and see everything that's going wrong. And we label all these wires and all these controllers that uh, at a glance we know what they do. We don't have to spend time tracing wires. Um, and then we also want to make sure the sight lines to other wear points, belts and gears and things are, are visible. We don't like cover covering things with heavy guards if they're known to be um, a chance that might fail. Um, or if we do, then we want to make those guards you know, clear if we can. Um, and modularity, you know, uh, design your intake so that it can come off very quickly. So if a spare intake, it can go snap right on and you can do that in, you know, if you have five minutes left before queuing for a match. Um, that looks at you know, things like how do you get tools in? If you have a, a buried nut and you can't get a wrench on it, that's going to um, extend your maintenance time from what could have been a 30 second repair to maybe a 20 minute repair. So think about uh, that ahead of time in your design. Okay, there are trade-offs to risk-informed design. Um, if you have robust design margins, if you overbuild, you're going to have a heavier robot. I recognize that. Um, if you make conservative choices, you're not gonna be able to do the fun things. You're not gonna be able to um, push the limits um, and not incur more risk, right? So there's a trade-off there between um, being reliable and sort of um, being more adventurous. Uh, and then it's gonna be more expensive. Fault-tolerant designs, if you're gonna double up um, mechanisms, if you're going to add, you know, uh, backups, then obviously you're going to need more components like redundant motors um, or, a, or a second mechanism to do a thing. You know, in 2018, I was very proud our, our climber was, our elevator um, did the scoring and it also did the climbing, same mechanism. That was very, very cool. I was very proud of that. But it meant that if that elevator failed, then we could do neither of those things, right? It would have been better to have a separate climber and a separate scorer so that either failed, we could still do something on the field, right? Um, so, but of course that adds more cost and more time and more space and all that stuff. Uh, sometimes uh, a complex risky mechanism is worth it. So I have a picture here of a swerve module, right? Swerve is becoming the meta in FRC. It might, um, you know, it's, a complicated double gearbox all in one. If any part of that fails, your robot doesn't really drive and that's kind of the basic thing your robot has to do. So why take that risk? Well, because being able to move sideways and being able to score on any side of your robot adds some real performance advantage. 
So you can't, so if you can't eliminate that risk, start thinking about substitution, start thinking about um, making, buying components and installing them and maintaining them uh, so that they are as reliable as they can be. You know they're gonna be a risk. Um, turrets can sometimes be that, that same thing. Machine vision can be that kind of same thing. And all of this takes more money and more time. It takes more experience. And I know those things are in short supply. Um, so hopefully by putting them out, at least I know I can tell teams what they're up against. So section three, um, reliability focused maintenance. Um, you know, if your robot's gonna fail, the last chance to catch it is in the pit before a match. So um, we do a lot of things in the pit uh, in order to try and catch those failures. Um, so we start before we even go to competition, we bring everything. We bring all the tools, all the parts, all the, we make spares ahead of time for everything we know could break and everything that might break. Um, and uh, we bring more than just fits our robot. We kind of bring all of the components we expect our partners um, might use because uh, our, our pit kind of becomes like a Home Depot at competition. We never want to be, because uh, other teams come to us shopping for things. We never want to be caught without a part um, or have our partner uh, be looking for a part so that we can't win that match. Um, okay, another important thing, system checks. So if you don't know what system check is, really simple. Before every match, that's what's happening in this photo here. Have uh, a driver or operator pick up the sticks and run through everything that that robot does. Drive forward, drive back, drive left, drive right, spin, turn, put the robots in an X lock, deploy the intake, um, spit out a ball, lift the arm, do the climb, whatever it is. Go, you know, check the cameras, do everything. And you can get it down with training down to like sort of like a minute long, 60 seconds long or 90 seconds long. Um, it's a very quick check, but you can make sure that if something's broken on the robot, you can see it and that gives you time to do something about it. So for that, to that end, we do system checks after every match, uh, before every match, um, after every repair, and after every code push. Um, we do it before we let students go off to lunch because we don't want to be caught with a uncaught with a, a problem that we didn't notice about and we come back after lunch just before a match and find out that there's no more time left to fix it so um, system checks are crazy important um, mechanical inspections as well we look at every single uh, bolt and and nut and make sure that uh, they're tight we look for cracks on all the lexan parts um, in future, we're going to do more uh, uh, logging uh, of the signals that the RoboRio is getting and looking through those, and uh, it's called telemetry, um, to see if there's any kind of increase in, in current usage or temperature on the motors um, to try and detect flaws. So all those things are trying to prevent or catch errors before they become uh, real problems. Outside the pit, uh, we want to make sure the robot is set up perfectly, right? So we have the system called dual approval. Uh, we have two team members, two students on the field, and they don't leave that robot until they both agree that it's set up properly. You know, I've seen other teams uh, set up a robot backwards for auto. It's pretty common. Um, it's less common if you have two students do it, but it's not perfect. You know, in, early in this season, uh, our robot has clip-on handles, and we left those on for an early practice match. Uh, thankfully, it was caught, but obviously neither student saw that those handles uh, were there and had they been left on, they would have got caught in the swerve modules or under the robot or something. So um, making, you know, that's maybe a, a question about elimination. We actually afterwards added some big red flags to them to say, hey, these are more visible. Don't, don't leave these on. Um, another uh, technique we use uh, is shown in this photo. Uh, we have our technician, uh, or sorry, our operator set up the driver station and she'll put her thumb down uh, in front of the window until everything looks good on her end. So she'll have the robot connected. Uh, she'll have our software does a little uh, pre-match sort of system check itself. Um, so it will give green lights if everything comes up uh, in nominal sort of in, um, software parameters. Uh, they'll check that the camera is running. That's important for our machine vision. Um, and until those things are all checked out, she'll keep her thumb down and our technician will stay on the field as long as, as, long as they can. Sometimes we get pushed out by um, FTAs and CSAs, but um, being respectful, we really don't want to leave the field until we know that that robot is, is working. Um, we uh, do a lot of debriefs uh, between pit team and drive team so that 
everyone is aware of any flaws that, that they observed in the match or, or things that didn't quite get fixed in um, the pit. Um, and then those things are brought to strategy meetings. If you, you know, if your robot has been known to be a little finicky, you want to go to strategy meeting and say, look, we may not be able to climb uh, because this mechanism has been giving us problems. So if that happens, I will tell you and, and you're going to come in and, and climb in this position without us. Um, and then we have a roving repair team. And I'm going through these things really, really quickly. But um, we have a team of students who are dedicated to go around the pits and find anyone who's broken, even if they're not a team that we play with, uh, and, and help them fix for two reasons. One, we want to make sure that we're competing against teams that are competing at their best. That's kind of the mission of first. Uh, we want all those feel bad moments to go away and everyone to see their robot perform. But also, you know, you never know. Um, that, that team might be in your playoff alliance. Um, it might be someone you see in the next event um, or in a year future. Uh, so, you know, building up that goodwill is really important. Um, if, if you can help, uh, then that's a really good thing, especially for experienced teams to do. Uh, lastly, continuous improvement. Um, we try to get better. You know, when we, we still have flaws. I've talked about some of them. Um, the way we try to get rid of those is we have the, uh, a debrief after every event. And so that's where we list, and this is sort of the report from one of these debriefs, um, everything that worked, uh, everything that didn't work, and any new ideas that students came across. Um, and we write those down uh, so that we can socialize them, so we can make sure those lessons are learned. And this takes a while. This, you know, to get out a full board here of 100 or so lessons um, can take a couple hours. It usually takes a full meeting after an event. Um, but it's important because uh, if we don't do that and we don't post those results, then we risk making those mistakes a second time. And there's um, no excuse. There's an excuse for the first time you make a mistake. There's no excuse for the second. If you do run into a problem, um, it may not be obvious how to fix it, right? And so we do a thing called a post-mortem. Um, so mechanism had failed. Let's spend a bit of time thinking about why it failed. And we use a technique called the five whys, uh, where you ask five why questions um, to find the root cause. So for instance, if, if uh, the robot failed on the field, you ask, why did it fail on the field? Well, because our, our front left uh, swerve module failed. Well, why did that front left swer swerve module fail? Well, the, the steering gear got jammed. It, it didn't, couldn't steer at all. Well, why couldn't it steer? Um, because the gear was worn out because um, we didn't lubricate it. Well, why didn't we lubricate it? This is my fifth why. Oh, it wasn't in the pit checklist. Okay, well, here's something we can finally do something about, right? We can add that to the pit checklist. We can make sure it never happens again once we fix that swerve module. Um, and uh, we've kind of drilled down to what might be considered the root cause. You can keep going, but five is a good number. Um, the... Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great way to identify all of the things that, that could have stopped the, the failure, uh, all the barriers that could have been there that, that didn't get uh, there. Once you, you have these lessons, we encourage sharing that OPEX, that operational experience. Um, share it widely, uh, even if it's embarrassing, right? Uh, we post a lot of stuff to Chief Delphi. We're joining the Open Alliance in 2024. Um, that can be a vulnerable thing to do. Um, you might be feeling like you're calling out uh, a vendor uh, on a product, um, you don't want to embarrass them. You don't want to call out a student that made a mistake. Um, but if everyone does that, uh, and you do it sort of with open eyes and, and agreement, and you, you take that feedback um, with uh, grace, then uh, we can all learn that lesson. And you know, there's a uh, 3,500 teams. Uh, in FRC, thousands and thousands of students on those, lots of opportunity for mistakes. We will all learn more if we are sharing them with each other than if we're sort of hoarding them away privately. Um, what do you do with all those lessons? You got to keep getting better. You have to keep iterating. That's a hard thing to do. I know a lot of teams run out of steam um, at the end of February, but um, it's the post bag area, sorry, era, um, the post bag age. Uh, your week seven robot uh, doesn't have to look like your week one robot. You can, you can build a robot, learn everything you want from that, learn things from other teams, other Open Alliance teams or not, other things you saw at competition that you brought back to your debrief and make improvements to your robot so that by the time you get to week seven, you know, you've got something much, much better than you did to start with. So in that, 
um, idea. Where's FR, or sorry, where's uh, 5406, where's Celtex going in the future? Um, we're gonna try a couple new things. Uh, we're gonna learn from Team 1678. Um, this is something I've resisted in the past, but um, I think uh, we, we fell behind schedule in 2023. So um, one thing we'd like to do is have a working robot done earlier. 1678 does this thing with, um, uh, it's kind of agile design or you know um, upgraded robots. They have an alpha robot, uh, we're going to try and have our alpha robot done by as early as week three. Um, something running on the field, playing the game by week three of build season so that we can learn all the things that we can learn from it, even if it's not accomplishing all our goals. Um, and so instead of trying to build the perfect robot in six weeks, we're going to build the minimum robot in three weeks and then add upgrades to that as we can, as we have time for. So no matter what happens, you know, if that upgrade doesn't finish, we still can fall back to a working robot. Um, so that's one improvement. Wish us luck. It's going to be a lot of extra work. Uh, logging, we're, we're going to do more um, self-logging um, with Advantage Kit this year. We might even have a team of students just looking at logs. Um, those are two big improvements in 2024. Um, if you really love this idea of reliability, uh, I recommend checking out um, this thing called FMEA or failure modes and effects analysis. Uh, Team 4607 has a really good write-up of this on Chief Delphi. It's a good way to look at your whole mechanism mathematically and kind of identifying which are the, the most risky components and that helps you shape your design to add more redundancy or, or spend more um, time you know, minimizing risks on, on one thing in particular. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about FMEA here. Uh, other things we want to look at, um, collaborating with other teams and scouting to have more redundant data um, and, uh, and make it more fun. Um, we want to keep looking out for better mechanical designs. Um, we're always looking for the perfect uh, intake plastic. We're still on the hunt for that. Uh, and then in the off-season, we want to keep developing new skills so that um, hopefully one day we'll finally achieve that goal of uh, no on-field breakdowns. That's it. That's the end uh, of uh, my advice for building reliable robots using high reliability practices. Uh, as I said, we're not perfect. Um, if you have uh, any suggestions for us, um, then I encourage you to email me at brendan.j.simons at gmail.com uh, or the team at celtexrobotics at gmail.com. Um, or if you have any questions about something I posted, I didn't get to say everything that was on the slide. So if you saw something that caught your eyes and want to know more about it, email us. Um, I'll be in the chat, I hope. Um, it's a work day, so no guarantees of that. But um, uh, ping me and um, uh, hopefully I can uh, help out. If not, if I don't reach out to you, uh, then I wish you my, my uh, sincerest um, uh, best wishes and uh, good luck in 2024. Um, it's been fun. Thank you for your time.